which as you all know becomes more and more threatening and uh, unpredictable day by day. And this morning also, I, on the news, I saw some tweets of President Trump. And we, in this institute, we have always used our scholarship to work towards peace. So I hope that there will be peace. Uh, we are very fortunate that we have uh, the round table so everybody will express their views. But we have three speakers from outside and I'd like to introduce them. Dr. Ella Bernada, a well-known scholar who uh, was uh, very well noted as a scholar and as a teacher in the Institute of Learning at the University of Karachi. Now she is head of the Center for Area and Policy Studies at the Institute of Business Management. I'm extremely grateful that Dr. Moini has found the time to be with us today. He is Professor of Social Development and Policy in the School of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences at Habib University. And uh, there is Ambassador Sayyid Hassanati. He has been a Pakistan ambassador in many, many countries. He has uh, first-hand knowledge of the situation on the ground many countries in which he has served and currently he is Senior Research Fellow of the Institute of Business Management in Karachi. I would be very, very grateful if we could start with uh, Dr. Mahmoud's to start the discussion. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, first of all, I'm not representing the Iranian government Whether it be nuclear or not, but 
always has a fresh. Inference is concerned. You can just watch. Because we are still involved in our internal affairs so deeply that even we are not believe those internal problems. But I can give my own opinion that what's happening in the world is not what America wishes or the other countries wish. It's something that has been happening always in the history. This prevailing world order, we know that it was devised just after the First World War. And they did what they wanted to do with the world. So likewise, probably that world order has become outdated. In my opinion, soon a new world order has to come up. We have to watch that. And what kind of world order that would be, what script would be have. In my personal opinion, whatever it comes, it will be against Muslim world. Muslim world, unfortunately, should fight it. And probably so less competent, competent to understand these things. So, I just think it Allah will be the same. I think we are discussing a very important matter today on which depends the future of not only the Muslim world but the entire world in a way. I was trying to um, uh, investigate uh, this uh, issue from various dimensions. I think the leadership, especially in Iran and Saudi Arabia, that is one area which uh, we need to study. The history of the two countries because they are the main players uh, in this conflict. Uh, as far as the United States is concerned or Western countries are concerned, I have noticed that uh, the new world order that Jen Tsar was talking about, Bush tried to impose an order on the world. I don't think he was that successful, but the search for ideas to reorganize the world according to the interests of Western countries is still on. I was trying to analyze Iran's uh, strategy uh, defense strategy to face this onslaught if it takes place. If there is an attack on Iran, it's not going to destroy Iran, it's going to destroy that whole region and I think it's going to have uh, terrible consequences for the rest of the world, especially for the Muslim world but also for the rest of the world, oil factor and all that uh, needs to be taken into account. Uh, but I think the United States will not have the guts to attack Iran because Iran, it's not just emotionalism, they have made a very good defense uh, strategy. They have analyzed what happened in the past and drawn their conclusions on the basis of that. Uh, I think United States will not be able to attack Iran, but they can try other methods. You see, if you look at the attitude of Western countries in the past, T.E. Lawrence, who was T.E. Lawrence and what was he sent to the Arab world to do? He did his job and nobody was able to stop him. Uh, now, uh, I was reading Defense Journal, there was a very good article in it, and in that the author has suggested that the Western world is going to rely more and more on non-state actors. They accuse Pakistan, they accuse Iran, they accuse many Arab countries of using extra, uh, uh, you know, uh, these uh, non-state actors. But themselves they've always used non-state actors, they've depended on them. 
And I think that is one area. They try to destabilize Pakistan by using these non-state actors. Kulbushan Yadav was sitting in Chabahar like a businessman, but he was not a businessman. He was a, an Indian spy. Not only a spy, but actually a terrorist. There are many other actors as well. So I think the regional states should now, including Iran and Saudi Arabia, they should bury the hegem. They should try to forget what happened in the past and try to protect their own people, the Ummah, the region, and the rest of the world as well. They need to sign a charter kind of thing promising each other that they are not going to try to bring about regime change. Saudi Arabia tried to do that in Syria, Iran tried to do that in Yemen. But regime change is something that should be done by the people of that area and other countries should not even support it. Let it be an effort exclusively uh, directed by the people, leadership, opposition of that country. The other thing I think they need to agree on is that they not interfere in each other's internal affairs. I know sometimes it's very difficult to do that because uh, you know you feel that the government is following wrong policy, they are trying to repress their people, but other states' involvement complicates the matter even more, and it's the people who suffer. When I look at the pictures of people from Syria, Yemen, you know, I feel horrified. I just want to add that uh, it's not only Iran, uh, which is uh, I mean, uh, some, I mean, uh, American uh, don't like or Russians don't like, uh, but it's all the regional issues uh, which are going on. Like uh, in my point of view, um, Gawadar is also very important, CPEC is very important. And the influence which will come after the completion of uh, this Gawadar board in all operational uh, uh, time, uh, then uh, I think more uh, influence of China and Central Asian states will be felt in this region. That's why uh, the Western Trump uh, is also. Um, I mean, just trying to threaten or uh, giving some indications that if uh, so and so countries will um, influence these areas uh, or try to uh, come into this area and, and, and uh, have some sort of influence in this, in this region, uh, then uh, Americans and Russians will not uh, stand still. So uh, this is some sort of uh, threat or indication that in the future if something happens against the will of the uh, Americans or the Westerners uh, and uh, the interest will be damaged anyway, so America will not It's not, uh, they are not going to uh, act right now, but it's sort of indication that in the future they might do something. Surprisingly, the uh, United States was not uh, 
vehemently opposed by the other parties to be able to protect. How can you withdraw uh, from this agreement uh, unilaterally? Uh, although we see that uh, in current scenario only uh, Britain is uh, desperately uh, supporting uh, the United States and they have sent some ships to Persian Gulf. Germany and other countries have simply refused that they will not stand by uh, or they will not uh, participate in any forces sent to either for any in any election, so they will not be part, participating in any force which will uh, be required to attack Iran if there is any attack on Iran. First of all, it is quite, uh, I'm 99% I'm sure that America or other forces are incapable of attacking Iran in the same manner they attacked uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, or they carried out actions. In Libya or see the Turkey, I don't think so. They can do uh, that. Second thing, uh, which is uh, very interesting, is that there are three countries which want America to attack Iran, and they are Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and Israel. We should not forget the Israeli factor. And uh, probably uh, President Trump. Uh, realize that uh, America is going to be used as a proxy for uh, national interests of these three countries. And uh, if there is a, a conflict in Persian Gulf, I think the most, uh, the first affected country would be uh, UAE, followed by Bahrain, Saudi Arabia. These three countries will suffer the most. Uh, what we see uh, presently in the last two weeks happening, is uh, the thin line between provocation and tactics. Uh, for example, uh, you can say that uh, did the American drone enter Iranian uh, uh, airspace, that would be a provocation. But if it was not in an Iranian airspace, then the provocation was on the Iranian side. And uh, I think at the moment uh, deterrence by Iran is working and uh, you know, uh, it is laughable for America, uh, President uh, Trump to say, I called off the attack because it was this proposed date and 150 people would have died for in uh, uh, answer in response to an unmanned aircraft's uh, downing. Since when America has been thinking about loss of life? Uh, uh, look at what has happened in Libya, for example, or Syria, or etc. Or even in Balkans, <laughs> since when they've been thinking about loss of life, I think America finds itself in a very tight spot. And uh, they will take some action. What will that action be? I really don't know. Uh, but uh, uh, because uh, if they don't take action, they will lose face. Uh, whether that action will be diplomatic, economic, or military, but they will have to take action. And you know, there are uh, things like America has done in the past. For example, uh, America, for example, destroyed Iranian offshore oil platforms in particular during uh, uh, when uh, Iranians uh, had attacked, uh, left uh, mines in particular. Uh, you know that that happened in 1990s. Uh, so. They can take some action like that, uh, or they can uh, capture Iranian ship um, uh, somewhere uh, on, uh, in international waters, or something like that. But uh, I don't think an all-out war is possible. And uh, if, for Pakistan, I think uh, uh, we are playing the card correctly. We are playing by being, being neutral because it is our. Uh, many I've read many articles in which uh, in the New World Order people are advising that if there is a New World Order, Pakistan should side by Iran, uh, sorry, by China and Russia rather than uh, uh, go the line of the Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Let's let's look what is happening on the ground first. We have it's a very complex situation, and uh, I really wonder. That in, when it comes to very close fight, whether Russia or America commit their whole resources to the conflict. Because neither Russia nor US is totally 
oil dependent on the Middle East. So all this oil is basically for China. So at the first layer you find non-state actors, you may call them whatever name, but on the first layer of the complex is, is the fighting forces which are non-state actors as Dr. Thalas referred to them. To me they are just chaos creating elements collected uh, on the basis of ethnicity or tribal or whatever uh, issues they can generate. And on the second layer you have countries that have direct interest in the region, like Iran, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Israel, Germany, Europe, whatever. Is it like in case of Libya it's more Europe than uh, America. And on the top layer you will find Russia and America, so it, uh, plus China. So it's a very, very complex situation and addition of any new actor will further complicate it. So the situation is complex. The commitment of superpowers is very doubtful in it. So when, if the conflict will start, it will be basically financed and uh, muscled by the local powers, namely Saudi Arabia, UAE, Iran or whatever are the actors in it. America, I agree with the Admiral Saab that will be simply taking an action because next is the election year, they cannot go away without taking any action against Iran. So it will be a symbolic yet in a substantial way. What it can be, uh, it, it's a very open guess game. So, and in, if, uh, based on my little experience of Iran, Iranians are very intelligent in brinkmanship. They are very intelligently handle the negotiations. So the chances of error in this complex from the Iranian side is less. But if you look towards the Saudi Arabians, they are at the moment very strong. It's a bad word to use, but they are done go. They are ready for action. They, they punished Qatar because Qatar was doing things bigger than its size. Because of all. See, there is a very complex situation in the Middle East. If you look minus Iran from the situation and just look at the Arabs themselves, what is the problem with Qatar? Qatar is having resources of the gas, which is the fuel for future. Saudis so know correctly that the petroleum future is slowly reducing. We are talking about non-fossil fuel and gas is much cleaner than oil. So the resources that Saudi Arabia has its uh, hand will reduce gradually. So the other fuels are coming up, maybe solar or wind or gas or whatever. So there, there is an inter-country rivalry in this region, there are extra. So this situation is complex and briefly referring to our role because of Pakistan's weak situation and our proximity to the region and our relationship with all the players. Turkey, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, UAE, our options are totally limited. The, the best that we can do is issue very nice statements, start, uh, moving around politics and religion, neighborhood, based on the morality. See, in this whole situation, nobody is talking about morality. Morality of supporting non-state actor, morality of supporting one neighbor against other, Similarly, the U.S. support in Yemen has no morality in it. The day has come that we should start looking towards morality. Thank you very much. It's difficult to say anything. Pakistan, why Iran, as people are saying, one of the background of this whole thing is and background for this is that this may go as far as pressurizing or affecting Pakistan on CPAC front. Because as per the trends of the people, we going to be high powers of movement, including the Arabs, is that they are looking for their share in CPAC. And uh, people are jealous of Pakistan or whatever we are expecting in general of CPAC. So I would say that this is a war, not only political, but the economic also. Thank you. He is at Oxford University and he says that China's rise, or he calls it the rise of the East, is beginning to bother the West. So probably is this 
an effort to stop the rise of East, I don't think they can do it like this. But in this very institute, about 25 years ago, I read a book by George Cannon. George Cannon uh, is known as a very uh, famous, well-known strategist, diplomat. In that book, he raised some very important points. At that time, I did not note them. I did not, uh, you know, put them in that context. He says, uh, this book was written somewhere in 1950s, and in this book he says that the world is changing, developing countries, countries in Asia and Africa are becoming independent, and they have big populations. And what is going to happen in future is that their people are going to put pressure on their governments to take control of their natural resources. And if that happens, the West will find it very difficult to deal with this issue. So he said, we must find a strategy now. And I interpreted that to mean their interest in family planning, promoting family planning type of things in the third world. But now I can see the context. There's another context. If you count the number of casualties in the third world since all these wars started, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Libya, Syria, Yemen, and there was an American general he gave a statement that we are going to knock out six countries in five years. And they countered those six countries. But I think their objectives are not limited to those six countries. They are far wider. And other countries are also uh, at risk. Iran, Pakistan, even Saudi Arabia. So uh, they are all at risk. I think is it too much to expect? I mean, let's speculate on what George Cannon was trying to achieve. George Cannon was an icon. At that time, he was an icon. We haven't heard from him. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, I want to talk about two topics that the gentleman raised. One is the morality, and the other is the changing world order. Uh, I lived in America for 14 years, and uh, I was uh, very actively involved in the life in America. So, uh, as far as morality is concerned, I don't think American government is in any position to represent uh, any moral value in the world. So that is something that we have to have in mind. Uh, I'm not talking about American people. Some of my best friends are American still. Uh, we actually pray together that there will be not war. So, but uh, I think it's important to bear in mind that uh, that the United States uh, does not have any rights uh, after the war in Iraq and Afghanistan and all these, uh, you know, mass murdering innocent people uh, to, to say that we are in the start of the world to represent democracy, uh, freedom of speech, freedom of uh, press. I just look at uh, uh, how they are treating African Americans in the United States. Uh, divorce rate, uh, the basically the decline of the institution of family, uh, even the decline of Christian values. Less than 50% of Americans go to church these days. So, uh, real world politics is not about morality. It's about, uh, my understanding is about material interests. And that leads us to the second topic, and that is the changing world order. So uh, as far as uh, I can see it, uh, uh, and it, it helps if we go back a little bit into history, see what happened during World War II and before World War II, Great Depression. Uh, we know that it was war that helped America drag itself out of Great Depression, a depression that lasted for a decade, and uh, the country was one third of its productive value, one fourth of its labor force. And it's very ironic that uh, none of the policies really worked except war. 
And it was because of involvement of the United States in World War II and the fact that World War II had the United States to drag itself out of the Great Depression that the United States economy has become addicted to war. It's an addiction for the United States. And uh, what is what is the point of producing a glass? Well, we use it to drink water. What's the point of producing an iPhone? We use it to read your emails or communicate or call PR to get the address. What is the point of producing a drone or a bomber or a battleship or a fighter? It's just for killing. So we drop bombs on people and, uh, well, and how do you use it? You start wars. And that is why America is addicted to war. If, if it doesn't start wars, its main industry, which is the military industry, it won't, it won't arm. And now we have the rise of China and India and the return of Russia as a superpower, back to the international scenes. And that has created a very interesting dynamic that uh, the United States is not the only superpower anymore after it enjoyed being the sole superpower for a while after the collapse of Soviet Union. So it's not easy to wage a war. I don't believe, as the gentleman said, that uh, uh, President Trump is concerned about moral values of 150 lives of Iranians. Uh, it's very hard to imagine that he cares about moral values. But uh, reality of, on the ground uh, actually dictates to the United States that waging another war is not going to be as easy as it as it used to be. American public opinion is not for another war in the Middle East. Iraq and Afghanistan have been a disaster. And ironically, and that is an important contradiction that we have to have in mind, that an economy which is addicted to war, if it enters another war, it's going to go into depression. Uh, Mark Krugman, who is a Nobel laureate, uh, American economist, professor of economics, used to at Princeton and writes a blog in the New York Times, uh, wrote an, uh, a very short blog which I usually assign uh, to my students. In that blog he says, uh, the, the title is really uh, in, uh, ironic, uh, an Iraqi re recession. By Iraqi recession, it means the United States economy going to recession after it went to Iraq and attacked Iraq. Uh, it used to be the case that when Americans spend money on military, their economy boomed. But now the economy busts if they spend more money on, on the military. And that may be related to that changing world order and the rise of other superpowers and the changing the internal dynamics of the United States economy, which in a contradictory way is still is dependent on war and militarism, but if it goes to another war, if we go into recession. That is uh, what we can discuss from a political point of view. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I agree with Professor Moini that uh, uh, US morality is, is not there. But the point is that they have a very nice client at the moment. Maybe Saudi Arabia and UAE, they are ready to finance it. They, they are now the biggest buyer of U.S. weapons. So, uh, is it possible, it's a very open question, is it possible that U.S. may go into war for any reason, having very nice countries to support it? Thank you. Uh, I think it's uh, unrealistic and naive to assume that there will be no war. I'm not going to bet on that. So, uh, as the uh, gentleman said, uh, well, Israel is a very key factor. We all know that they have ambitions about greater Middle East. Uh, we are about to annex the West Coast, the West Bank. They have already gotten rid of Libya, Iraq, Syria is in chaos, and uh, Yemen is also struggling. And they are, they are very clear about that. So, uh, as we know, they have a very strong lobby in the United States. Uh, I'm not sure about the role of Jared Kushner, 
President Trump's son in law. Uh, it seems that they have the, he has the President's ear. So, uh, but <coughs> is it going to be an easy war? Uh, I think the answer was already given. It's not going to be as easy as war with Iran. Iran is a large country. It's, uh, uh, it has actually two militaries, as you know. It's maybe one of the only countries in the world that has two militaries, the conventional and revolutionary guards. Revolutionary guards are very well funded, well financed. They have their own hospitals, universities, ports, research centers, and uh, immense amount of political uh, power. And they have the full support of the security leader and vice versa. The fact that the drone was shot down is, is an indication. Whether it was a Russian missile or a domestic missile, we don't know that. But it's an indication that the military abilities there, at least uh, in limited scale. So, uh, what Saudis uh, uh, are fighting for? Well, I think they feel insecure. So, Saudi is not a democratic country. There are uh, movements, uh, women movements, journalists are asking for more freedom. And uh, the rivalry, of course, goes back uh, as far as uh, 1979. So. Yeah, yeah,
maybe your short tool. What they will lose is much more than the finance to get a profit from this world. I hope they have rationality, they respect rationality to stop any financing the world. Our government, our dear supreme leader, always say that Iran will never start a war. We never start a war. But as we show in recent days, even the counterpart is US. We don't afraid US. We show that every country in the world may say that we don't afraid US. But maybe Iran is the only country which acts and show it in reality. We shut down an important, a high-tech US drone. Maybe Mr. Trump get a moral person, maybe. If he is he concerns about morality, I really hope he stop war in Yemen. Iran never started war, but always defends its own country, even if against US. It is our most important politics in the region. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and please, I will be I'm uh, Dr. Tanvir Khalid, Secretary of the Institute. Uh, um, the topic was uh, Middle East and uh, concerning three specific countries. But uh, uh, whenever we talk of a region, because of the nature of the wars and because of the undercurrents that are involved, it is never that region alone, but others as well. So when we talk of the Middle East, definitely the United States or transatlantic um, uh, region countries are involved directly or indirectly. In this case, it is the United States which is, has always been involved. Now there are, if we try to have a consensus, but we know that as a think tank, we cannot influence, but we can at least give our uh, consensus or opinion on what likely uh, uh, approaches can be taken or can be suggested and it is up to the country's concern to take that. So I feel that in this, at least if we agree, that we know that in international relations it is diplomacy which is very important and diplomacy means in certain aspects dialogue and dialogue can be face to face or in other methods are involved through mediation or conciliation so I believe that the major countries in this that is Saudi Arabia and Iran they must be brought to the table of course that they are Always sovereign welcome diplomacy. Yes. Always. yes so uh, it should be suggested so that those who matter give this it a more prime importance. Then uh, uh, it is believed that the matter of the drone attack will be taken or the approach of Iran will be taken by the United States to the Security Council and the uh, uh, um, meeting will be conducted. So I expect, uh, we believe that the Iranian government must mobilize all influence in in the European sector so that it has supporters there and a decision cannot be taken which is sometimes it is on the influence or pressure of any powerful country. So Iran has relations with China, it has relations with Russia, but how the matter is taken because openly the American government has been pointing out that it is if it is not going to war, it is going to put sanctions. Those sanctions can cripple any country's economy, and if the economy is crippled, crippled then normally it is also the foreign relations which are affected. So this is what I suggest should be done. Besides morality, we don't expect that the United States is going to interfere uh, on moral grounds, but when it begins, its campaign or its invasion or intervention, it is always on modern grounds. That means to support human rights, to promote democracy. These are all the concepts which are taken 
are presented by the United States. And we must keep in mind what is, who is in power. In the United States, a group of military strategists, including John Bolton now, who is again there to advise the Prime Minister and the President, they can drag him into uh, a war. So we must be familiar with that and what approaches they are to take and conduct. So uh, Iran, as well as Saudi Arabia, they must know that things can change, transitions are there, but the pressure on the US government from their own people, from their own group, that must be avoided or it must be at least highlighted so that that approach is not taken. War games about the confrontation between Iran and the US Navy in Virginia. And the both sides were played by my no Iranians were involved in this game. And uh, in the opening uh, hours of this war game, uh, Iranians actually sent aircraft carrier inside Orchenda. Uh, and this uh, uh, aircraft carrier, Abraham Lincoln, which is deployed now, where is it standing? Uh, it is standing at the eastern tip of Oman. It is actually somewhere 150, 160 miles south of the water. It's not inside the Gulf of Umani. So, if they want to use this aircraft carrier, and uh, remember, uh, the military targets in Iran are not in Iranian Balochistan, or uh, it is not on the coast of Gulf of Oman. They are well inside. For example, if they want to attack the nuclear facilities, or the facilities where the Iran has factories for ballistic missiles, etc., etc. They are well inside. So this aircraft carrier, either it has to move well inside Gulf of Oman, uh, or it has to use air-to-air -air refueling. Again, if they want to use air-to-air -air refueling, these air-to-air -air refuelers, which are transport aircraft, they will be flying like this uh, drone was very close to the Iranian. Uh, anti-aircraft uh, uh, batteries. So I think as far as um, America is concerned, their Navy is not going to give them any, any advantage uh, in this, uh, if they want to launch an air strike, etc. Et so they are, uh, and second thing is, um, uh, this, uh, uh, I was, you know, calculating in my mind uh, that whether this drone was inside Iranian uh, territory or not, <coughs> this drone was flying at about 4 nautical miles high, 24,000 feet. And um, Iranian territorial waters are 12 nautical miles. So Iran was using a missile which, was, which had to travel, I would say, something like 12 to 13 nautical miles. Okay. And this 12 to 13 nautical miles if it was more than that, America had its destroyers and they could have shot down, in fact, the Iranian missiles before it struck the... Uh, so I think the, as, if, if you go by the pure geometry of this uh, attack on the Iranian, of the American road, I think it was more or less inside the Iranian uh, territory. And uh, Dr. Tanvir has said that uh, there should be UN Security Council uh, meeting on this drone uh, shooting down. Iran, I think in very few hours of the shooting down of the, this drone, has already written a letter to the UN Sec Secretary General explaining that how and where this drone was attacked. So Iran is, like we said, they, they, they are playing their diplomatic card very well and I think the most active uh, diplomacy in all this uh, scenario has been conducted by Iran. Their uh, uh, foreign minister and other delegations have been traveling all over the world. They have uh, visited uh, important capitals. Uh, so, militarily, America has actually got a very tough nut to crack. Uh, it's not something that they can, um, you know, uh, Iran is not Afghanistan, Iran is not Libya. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah. so we die. We don't welcome this idea. 
because we don't welcome war. We always welcome peace. We always welcome political initiatives. It was 10 years before the goal. In these 10 years, despite uh, uh, all sanctions imposed by US to Iran, Iran military and defense power grows very well. I'm sure that if US does the maneuver in this year or again in this month, the result would be more worse than 10 years ago. So they know that they cannot attack Iran. It's a reality they don't want to accept. I think that all American, all US government have one single mission to attack Iran, even Obama government or Trump government. We don't care who is their uh, consultant, who is their team. The American regime wants to change Iranian regime. It's their own mission. It's their own impossible mission. But they have different tactics for this main strategy mission. Iran has its own mission. We always welcome initiatives, welcome political initiatives, welcome peace, and we always welcome uh, other countries to manage the situation, to help us manage the situation. We have welcomed the uh, Japanese Prime Minister in recent days. But do you believe that we can trust U.S.? We trust U.S. before and signed a bilateral agreement. Who left their table? Iran or U.S.? Mr. Trump said that we are ready to negotiate with Iran. We want to stop nuclear bombing. We don't need any nuclear bomb, any nuclear uh, weapon. We should ask Mr. Trump and his team why you left the table. The relationship between two countries gets worse and worse in Trump's administration. Why? Because he do not believe in peace. He do not believe in negotiating with Iran. Iran believe in negotiating. Welcome any other countries to help negotiating. But negotiating is completely different from we accept all the situation, all the things US told. US help do this and we say, okay, we will, we will do this because we say it's not Iranian policy. Can I? I was going to say that we have a general in this gathering, so <laughs> maybe he can talk about the military aspect. Not the military aspect, but I think in our discussion, the Honorable Council is showing the script that the Iranian government has. So I personally feel that under such circumstances, we should not show emotion. We should not show our ego or strength. We should try to pacify the situation. That's their own decision. What is that the term? Morality has totally turned the discussion into different ways. In geostrategy or uh, these worldly activities, morality has hardly any space. The term may be used, but practically in the whole history of the humanity, where do you find the morality? I mean, it's a different ballgame. Probably what we didn't mention is the India, which is a very close ally of America and good relations with Iran also. 
So what is going to happen to this region and to us especially? Because we know the Indian intentions about us very well. We know what we think about the water. We know about it. So at that point, I don't know why I didn't come into this discussion. Militarily, it's very simple. It's a straight away geostrategic activity going on the last many years. They want to contain the Asia, let's call it China, Russia, etc. They have already contained through the Pacific. The only uh, area left is this side, which probably it seems that Gawadar is the biggest problem for them because if Gawadar or CPEC succeeds, then that Pacific would be pacified or neutralized and China would have a very uh, a good venue through this area, which India has openly opposed. And uh, our neighbors, we don't expect much uh, from Afghanistan or even uh, from India, we can expect Iran normally behaves in a little neutral way. We don't get much support uh, from Iran under such circumstances. And India has already uh, replied us. So, I don't know. You may not call it war, but the Americans would take certain specific decisions, whether a full-fledged war or limited war or a different kind of war, but there has to be some activity in this area. Because we are not going to go for the CPAC or the Gawadar, uh, and it's not acceptable to India or America. So, I don't know, somebody can throw more light on this. Uh, yes, there is a possibility of war or a limited action, but the only problem in war is boots on the ground. Technologically, America can bomb any place and in Iran and call it a nuclear facility. It could be a biscuit factory, like what happened in Sudan at one time. But they will, they have a technological advancement where they can have some air superiority. Whatever Iran has developed is remarkable for a developing country, but U.S. superiority in air is very, very clear. They can take any action, but the problem will arise when you have boots on the ground. Americans are now afraid, for, despite losing very few thousand uh, in Iraq or other places, they will not commit 100% troops. That is why, so the major ground offensive is not possible. Again, I will uh, endorse Professor Mumini's idea that the Iran has two tiered army. One is the National Army and second is uh, the siege, the Revolutionary Guards. If the war starts, the main resistance, uh, the bottom areas close to Iraq or UAE will uh, see the National Army, but when you come to the center, which is the place more mountainous, you will see the siege coming out and giving tough time. Americans know it better than us because they are working on it. So ground war is not possible because the Arabs are not ready to even fight against Yemenis, Houthis. So why they will be coming towards the uh, Iranians who are more trained and more ready to give their life for their country. Yes, Iran is a different country, different than uh, Afghanistan, different than Iraq, different than Syria, and different so to my mind, there, there can be hardly any ground war, but America will definitely show some uh, action uh, through air, whether it is through missile or through its air bombing, but they have to show something because next is the election year. Thank you. Can I make a small comment about regime change? Regime change is not so easy. Regime change probably was easier in Venezuela than it is in Iran. What is happening in Venezuela? I think uh, the president, uh, previous president is continuing. Uh, America has tried regime change, but they have not succeeded. In fact, if America was thinking of putting some uh, rangers kind of uh, people in Venezuela, but they backed out because they realized that regime change is 
not workable even in Venice Bay. I don't think anybody in Iran uh, underestimates the power power of the United States. If anybody did, there was, there wouldn't be this amount of investment in military research, military uh, production of artillery, you know, missiles, jet fighters. So I think Iran is very realistic in terms of uh, assessing the, the power power of the United States. So the question is, is Air Force the United States Air Force in Iran can be as effective as, you know, maybe the generals, the generals wanted to be effective. So, uh, and I'm saying that because I want to point to a few things. One is the role of John Bolton in uh, Trump administration. He's a very pro-war uh, person. Uh, Mr. Pongo is also pro-war. And then the factor that we have not discussed in this meeting is the role of Mujahideen Akhar, the militant group that retreated to Iraq in the war, Iraq towards the end of the war. And they just had a very big conference, very well founded one, and they invited Mr. Pompeo as a guest speaker. And the speechwriter of George Bush, I forgot his name recently, gave an interview saying that they offered him a $15,000 check for a one hour talk, which is a lot of money if you know how much you so uh, we have this uh, player which is not a state player, uh, but has been around for a while. Uh, and it has a history with the Iranian government. And uh, it seems that we have the ears of Mr. Pompeo and Mr. John Bolton, which is very unfortunate. In terms of Iranian government reaction to an invasion, uh, well, uh, Iranian government, Iran has ties with Indonesia forces in Iraq and Syria. Uh, I was reading this morning even in Indonesia and Afghanistan. So, and uh, it's not going to be a conventional war if that's what we did first And I'm sure that, uh, you know, American strategists are, are aware of uh, uh, the day the war will be fought if that's what we did first uh, I don't think American uh, opinion is for war. General public is against war. Yesterday news came out that uh, American military has, has serious issues with recruiting soldiers. Uh, they go to universities, even high schools, to recruit young men and women. And recently they have found it difficult to recruit people because, uh, because of many, many reasons. So, uh, well, there is a huge amount of propaganda, of course, but whether it's effective or not, we have to wait and see. And uh, I want to have a comment about uh, the point that young lady is about the proxy uh, wars. But, uh, it can be a solution to the problem that America cannot afford to uh, wage a full-fledged war as it used to be able to in, in, in pass. So selling weaponries to proxy uh, fighters is a good solution for America because weapons have to be sold anyway. They are produced to be sold. And now when you put it uh, uh, side to side to the fact that uh, American public opinion is, is against going to war and even against being recruited. So forming proxies Small militaries can be a solution for Americans. But uh, uh, again, the question is how, how, how effective that can be. So, again, uh, let, me, let me repeat that I don't think anybody in Iran understands the military power of the United States. Uh, uh, I don't want to brag about uh, uh, Iran has given the one Iran, but as you said, Iran is an intelligent and international. That there has been so much investment in military research development, production sites. Uh, it's, it's, it's a sign that we are taking the United States seriously. And it's because of that that we think the situation is, uh, is serious. And uh, the, the United States involvement 
engagement with humanity that was the end of war in Iraq sent a message to the Indian government that in Iran, Iran, you have to take this, this animosity and this driving seriously because it can happen again. As it happened in 1989 when they shot down that commercial uh, passenger rail run and uh, attacked the, the oil fields and the, uh, and the, the battle ships. So, that is my can you analyze what would uh, uh, Admiral Asaf has pictured the geographical position of nuclear in the oh, this is for US from the bear where they are? And what is the uh, end war going, air war going to be for which situation in Iran to the US going to stop? It's very thoughtful comments here. Yeah, our country will use nuclear weapons for its own security and for Shiaism. When it comes to Iraqi Shiaism, 
I mean, I will suggest you to watch it, the BBC documentary, it is called Freedom to Broadcast Hate. And when you have that kind of a narrative developed in the context of Middle East, when trust in two needs also to be taken into account. And if you look at the neighbors of Iran, the trust factor, I think uh, the way it should have been, has been uh, built up uh, in a kind of uh, uh, foreign policy that Iran has pursued. And in future, if you happen to believe that IRGC is populated by very intelligent people, I will tell you in 1982, it was IRGC that rejected the offer from the side of Saddam Hussein and said that no, we will go to Basra, we will go to Karabi, and we will go even to Madinah and Bhattari, right? And on the other hand, uh, if we look at what uh, IRGC, I mean, we have to see the passions within the Iranian society. I mean, you are talking about the unity and all the uh, rally around the flag kind of a situation that might arise if Iran is attacked. But on the other hand, there are factions within Iran. I mean, even the CGs and IRGC people are not always on the same, what you might call, uh, same level when it comes to making of uh, policies related to Iranian society is concerned. And uh, lastly, if I may, the JCPO, I mean, uh, the JCPO, everybody knows about that. Uh, it, US got its cake and eat it too. Right? You were, they went out of the deal, you are sleeping to the deal, and they are having all the work to my all the benefits out of it. And at the end of the day, I'm not saying that President Trump is the most you know, wisest of man, but the kind of decisions he is making and the kind of advice that he is taking uh, seems to uh, put in Iran in a spot whereby other regional powers may uh, in future do stuff uh, that may not be in favor of Iran as well. Or Iranian people. Okay, just one question. Okay. Uh, last year in September, uh, when the uh, situation deteriorated in Iraq, specifically in Basra, the only consulate which was burned to the ground was the Iranian. Right? And we tend to believe that Iran is the most what you might have, benign power as far as that region is concerned. It wasn't done by Al Qaeda, it wasn't done by ISIS, it was done by the people that previously Iran itself has been supported. So the idea that Iran is doing everything right and they are but bringing friends here and there. Yes, yes. Uh, do you know what happened in Basra? The Iranian version is different and then we have other versions. No, that was not the case. The case was that because of U.S. illegal sanctions, Iran could not export electricity to Iraq. Can you imagine in a hot weather in a desert city. People should live without electricity. They mainly export their energy from Iran side. When Iran cannot export electricity to Basra due to US sanctions, what can Iran do more? We, as a Muslim country, wants to help all Muslim countries without mentioning their uh, religion. Are they Sunni? Are they Shias? We pay many costs due to Palestine. You cannot find, I think, even one Shia in Palestine. But we pay costs for Palestine for 40 years. You think that U.S. has problem with Iran because of, I don't know, uh, 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 weapons, missiles, it's not their problems. The only problem, the main problem, is why Iran supports Palestine. It's their main concerns, not uh, weapons, missiles, etc. So Iran pay costs. Our serious question is, why other Muslim countries don't pay cost for what Allah says in Quran? Why you don't pay? Always Iran should pay cost? My friend told that Iran do not support Pakistan. I'm really surprised. I'm really surprised. We invest more than two billion dollars to complete IP gas pipeline under next of Pakistan border 
to help your country to overcome energy crisis. But you don't complete your own side. We don't even complain to you. We can go to international court and open case, open case for Pakistan, but we, we never do that. Because our superior leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, really loves Pakistani people, really loves Pakistan. In recent floats in Iran, let me be honest, in really floats in Iran, many people say that why Pakistani people don't help us as much as we help them in their floats. But it does not matter. Because we believe in Islam, we really believe in Islam. When you someone wants you to help him, we should help him. It's a real. It's a matter for Iran. We always support Pakistan, but you know that diplomatic cooperation, diplomatic relations. It's not a one-way road. It should be a two-way road. We don't want Pakistan to support us against the U.S. or other uh, possible war. We depend on our internal sources, our people. We don't need help from any other countries, European countries, Muslim countries, because in our national security strategy, we define our national security on our own abilities, not imported abilities. Saudi Arabia imported missiles, imported weapons, and also I heard that it imported pilots. But can it overcome a very little country in, the, in its neighborhood? We have an Aya in Boran says, Kamben fa'atim qalila, qalabash fa'atim kasira ba'ezmulla. We believe in this Aya. It says that if God wants, Little people, a small group of people, can overcome a superpower. We really, I as a diplomat, my country, my government, my people, my uh, superior leader, really believe in this fire. We have had eight years war against Saddam without any help. When he invasion your country, can you stay and say, yes, welcome, this is your country? No, you can't. You should also threaten Saddam. You should also threaten your enemy. Iran, as my friends tell, has a realistic policy. You told about, you said about uh, Iran uh, export its revolution to other countries. I said the example. I don't know, you know that Iranian people really love your Prime Minister Iran. They really love it. When they uh, went to Mashhad for Ziyarat, the security team have faced many serious problems, many serious challenges. Because every Iranian people wants to say hello to him, wanted to uh, take picture with him, want to talk to him. Because they love it. Why? Why Iranian people love Pakistan Prime Minister? Because in his campaigns before election, in his election campaign, 
he focused on uh, issues which are important for Iranian people. They love him. When he was elected last year, I was in Tehran, not in Karachi. I saw that many Iranian people got happy. Alhamdulillah, a Muslim prime minister related as our brother country, Pakistan, and he can help Pakistan to overcome its challenges. So, can we say that Prime Minister Imran Khan export his ideas to Iran? No, we can't. What can we do when other people, when other Muslims in other countries love our leaders, accept our ideas? Can we say, no, 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 you should not accept our ideas. Please go and don't accept our ideas. Because U.S. may say, European may say, Iran is exporting its revolution to other countries. Can we say that? Can we stop issuing our ideas? Can we, our supreme leader, stop announcing, speaking in public? No, we can't. It's a very simple situation. Iran don't want to export by force. <coughs> we are Muslim. When anyone, it should, it can be Prime Minister Imran Khan, it can be uh, our uh, Imam Khomeini, say about Islamic ideas. People, Muslim people, we love. It is their fault? No, it is not. And uh, just uh, one more notion, or one more note. Uh, maybe I should not say that, but uh, don't forget that maybe Iran is not as strong as U.S. in air warfare, maybe. But we showed that recently we are not some more weaker than US. And the, uh, my last point, don't forget electronic warfare in your analysis. You see what you have to hope, Alicia. <laughs> I invite you to come to our consulate right. and yeah. inshallah we can discuss face to face because we should respect other participants. I mean, we are sitting here to learn from each other. That, that's no, like, this is the spirit of the discussion here. Yeah? I'm so glad for your intervention. I'm going to wind up after this. Putting technology has to be updated. And you know, uh, I mean, U.S. can put sanction on Iran or Pakistan. These are two neighboring countries operating with each other, documented or undocumented. But uh, I mean, refining. Do you think Iran has any intention of upgrading their oil refining technology so it can be uh, I mean, compatible with the modern times? We always welcome, but as I told, this is not a one-way road, this is a two-way road. We had a delegation, high rank delegation from the Iran National Assembly uh, in Pakistan uh, previous week, last week. He visited Islamabad and then uh, came to Karachi, visited the uh, officials here, uh, Chief Minister, uh, Governor, National Speaker, uh, had, had a meeting with the Karachi Chamber of Commerce. They focused on that we are ready to expand economic uh, relations. We 
we are ready. But it's not enough. We are ready to export to technology. I, uh, actually, I'm uh, in uh, business, in economic effort in our consulate. Uh, we are completely ready, and when a Pakistani businessman go to Iran and visit it, visit Iran's ability in high-tech products, in nanoproducts, in technology, they really surprised. I'm at your all service to arrange meeting Iran because we had a. Uh, like poem in Farsi, Shenidan Kekobat Monande Didan. Listening is not uh, as much as seeing. Well, thank you for the invitation. I'm sure we will all invite to go as a group if you may arrange it. I'm very happy to put you now. Uh, I'd like to wind up now. And before I do, I would uh, like to ask if uh, Dr. Mwini, Ambassador Sabia, and Talat want to say a few words before we wrap up this session. Dr. Uh, I must say that it was a great pleasure coming here, listening to all the views. I am deeply interested in all the peace efforts between Iran, Saudi Arabia, other countries. And I think it's in the interest of all the countries to accept these initiatives. We, have, we don't have any one from Saudi Arabia. We could have asked them also to uh, prefer peace over war. And uh, I think we should not play into the hands of even if it's a superpower, sole superpower, whatever. We have our own interests as uh, Pakistan, as Iran interests uh, for the sake of other countries and we should not act as pawns in the hands of other countries. We should protect our own interests and our interests, I think, lie in peace. We don't have a war industry. Our interests don't lie in war. Thank you. Exactly. The diplomacy is all about creating opportunity, but passion is really remarkable. And I agree with Dr. Talat that since it is our own region, any war in Iran or UAE or Saudi Arabia will be definitely adversely affecting Pakistan. And as a career diplomat, we have always been working for peace. Whatever role we have, small or big, but to understand all this process is also essential and as, as an almost beautiful country in the region, we, we should pr uh, produce ideas towards peace. Thank you very much. So the United States uh, keep on investing in Saudi Arabia, uh, we did uh, invest internally, technologically, so even if we think in terms of our long-term interest, we have to uh, be ready to talk to each other and uh, try to find local solutions for global problems. If I may, uh, in response to your comment about exporting revolution, uh, maybe early on Iran was a more or less ideological country, but as it has moved from the past 40 years, it has learned how to think and act rationally. So it's not about exporting revolution anymore. It's about making sure that the regime will not be changed. So all the investment in Hezbollah and Indonesia and Iraq and Afghanistan has a very rational explanation. I remember when I was in Iran in one of the Friday prayers, the, the Friday Imam said Americans have their uh, uh, aircraft carriers, we have our militia. So and that makes a lot of sense because look, uh, you know, who's exporting what? It's the United States that has been in this region for 40 years, polluting the air, polluting the environment, trying to sell the idea that they are here to make sure that uh, there will be peace. So it's not about, I'm not saying it's not about ideology at all, but it's not all about ideology. It's also about thinking very rationally in terms of 
long term sustainability of the political regime. Thank you, Dr. Moini, and thank you, everybody, for making this such, a, such an interesting and delightful session. I'll just touch on two or three aspects of our discussion. One about morality. Well, in international politics and in power politics, there is no place for the morality. There never has been, and there probably, maybe there may be some utopian age in the future when great powers and small nations will think about morality, but mostly that is out of the question. Big powers like the United States, as somebody I think that I pointed out, do take a moral stand with respect to human rights, for instance, with respect to the uh, position of women or status of women, with respect to how children are treated in, in, in uh, developing countries, because that is a way of, of interference, really. So that is, they take that moral stand, but when it comes to their own position of power, there is no matter morality. There never has been in international politics, one thing. The other thing is that we have been, in a way, discussing whether there will be a war or there will not be a war. And there's a consensus in this group, as in fact there must be in all rational thinking that there should be not a war, because there, this region has already suffered so much Millions of people have been displaced. Millions of people have been turned out of their homes. Their lands have been devastated. So many people have been killed. And it is in this region. While the, there are other powers who have, have had a stake in the politics of this region, but their people have remained safe. So these thousands and thousands of people who have been this, this whole area has been devastated in every way. Even culturally, it has been devastated because of the the weapons that have been used over here in Iraq and in other parts of, of the Middle East. The other thing is about the trust, trust deficit so far as the United States or America is concerned. You see, as I think uh, Asif pointed out, how many people really believe what the United States or America says? They went on and on about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq and they devastated that country. And then they sent in their contractors and their, their businessmen to rebuild that country so that they could make an economic profit out of that. But they devastated that country and in the end there were no weapons of mass destruction. So in the same way, people will take with a pinch of salt when they say that the Iranis attacked these oil tankers. We don't know if they did, if they didn't, whether these uh, videos that we see are fake videos or the real videos. We don't know because we do. could cannot really trust anymore what is true and what is not true. With respect to Iran's nuclear ambitions, Iran went in for a deal that sanctions would be removed from Iran, because of which its people have really suffered for many, many years. In respect for the uh, in return for its assurance that it could not enrich uranium beyond a certain point. Uh, it is most unfortunate that the U.S. has withdrawn from that deal. And in fact, I think uh, the U.S. Supreme Leader also said that all right, they can also withdraw from the deal. And they have not, I think, got the, uh, got the assurance. Some European powers did assure that they would keep that deal, but not the kind of assertive assurance which they should have given to Iran. And in the end, I would like to say that uh, so far as Pakistan is concerned, we should continue our neutral new, new stand. Um, I empathize with a great deal uh, of what my Iranian colleague has said with respect to our relationship. Uh, but Pakistan has to play safe with all the players in this region. It has a very long-standing relationship with Saudi Arabia. Iran is our neighbor. We have a formal as well as informal trade with you. We've got an informal we trade with all your relationship with all countries. We don't interfere. That's very kind of you. <laughs> you don't interfere. I don't know. You know there are many ways of interfering, but I'm sure you don't interfere. However, whatever it is, we have to remain in peace with our neighbors. Uh, the only problem is that there is one country, which is every country's neighbor, and that is the United States of America. They say, you see, that the United States of America is the neighbor of every country in the world. So we have to, so we have to balance all these interests. 
and it is a and it is and it is a great challenge to our democracy. Thank you ever so much for coming, all of you, and I will invite you to have uh, have some tea and snacks with us on the ground floor. But before I wind up, I want to Dr. Moini give you this journal, Pakistan Horizon, which we have been publishing since 1948 without a break. It's the oldest scholarly journal in this country, and for the ambassador. And I'd like to give you the response. You you why don't you do your storage? Why don't you buy a whole set? Thank you ever so much, everybody, for coming. And let's meet downstairs with